So now that we have a general idea of what gluconeogenesis is and what, it's, and what it does and what it's used for, let's actually discuss the details of this process. And in this lecture, we're going to focus on the first two steps of gluconeogenesis. So remember, gluconeogenesis is the process by which specific types of cells, so liver cells and kidney cells, basically use pyruvate to build glucose molecules. So then the glucose molecules can be used by our body, our cells, to actually carry out different types of processes. Now here we have two steps on the board. First step of gluconeogenesis and the second step of gluconeogenesis. And what the goal of these two steps are, or what the goal of these two steps is, is to basically bypass the last irreversible step of glycolysis. Because remember, gluconeogenesis is not simply the reverse of glycolysis. And that's because glycolysis itself is a highly exergonic process. And so, for instance, we know that in step 10 of glycolysis, we transform pyruvate into, into phosphoenylpyruvate by using a very exergonic process. And so if we simply reversed that step in gluconeogenesis, this reverse step would be very endergonic. It would require a large input of energy. So to basically bypass that highly endergonic process, we create a different process, a different reaction pathway that bypasses it. And this is a much more favorable reaction. So in a two-step process, we're able to actually transform the pyruvate molecule into a phosphoenylpyruvate by using a favorable reaction pathway. So let's begin by focusing on step number one. And in step number one, we basically want to carboxylate a pyruvate molecule to form an oxaloacetate. Now, if we simply try to add a carbon dioxide onto the pyruvate to form the oxaloacetate, that reaction in, in itself actually requires energy. It would be an endergonic process under cellular conditions. But what we do is we couple that process with the hydrolysis of ATP into ADP and PI, orthophosphate. And because the hydrolysis of ATP is a highly exergonic process, we use that free energy to basically couple the uh, endergonic process of carboxylating that pyruvate molecule. So together, this process, the coupling of these two processes, the hydrolysis of ATP and the carboxylation of pyruvate actually creates a relatively favorable process. So now, Let's talk about this enzyme. So we essentially have a CO2 molecule that is attached onto the pyruvate to form the oxaloacetate. In the process, we hydrolyze the ATP into orthophosphate ADP, and we also form two H plus ions. And this is our oxaloacetate intermediate. Now, the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is the pyruvate because that's the substrate carboxylase because this is a carboxylation process. And this enzyme consists of four identical but individual subunits. Now, let's talk about, uh, let's talk a bit about these important regions that exist on the enzyme, on these subunits. So we have two very important regions. One of these regions, known as the biotin binding domain, actually contains this molecule, this helper molecule we call biotin. And biotin is actually used to bind that CO2 molecule. Now, another important site is a region that contains the area that binds an ATP molecule. And so we have to use that ATP molecule to actually activate that CO2 molecule to make it much more reactive so that we can actually attach that molecule onto pyruvate. Why? Why do we have to activate the CO2? Well, because we can simply attach the CO2 because that would require an input of energy. And so we have to activate it, make it more reactive. And that's where that ATP comes into play. 
So once again, pyruvate carboxylates consist of four identical subunits that each have a domain that has a covalently attached biotin prosthetic group. So this helper group that helps to bind that CO2. So we call this group the biotin binding domain that is used to bind the CO2 molecule. <coughs> <clears throat> molecule and bring it into the active site of the enzyme. So basically the active site that contains that pyruvate and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. And we also have that domain that actually binds that ATP molecule that is used to make that carbon dioxide much more active. Now this process actually involves three individual steps or we can call them mini steps. And so these are the steps that I've listed on the board. So let's begin with step number one. Now we know that inside our fluids of our body, we don't simply have a CO2 molecule dissolved because CO2 by itself is a very nonpolar molecule. And so it cannot simply dissolve in our blood. And we have an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that is basically used to transform the CO2 into bicarbonate ions. And this takes place in the cytoplasm of our red blood cells. And so we actually find bicarbonate ions dissolved in our cytoplasm and in our blood. And so in the first step, what we do is we essentially activate that bicarbonate molecule to form this carboxyphosphate intermediate. So we transfer a phosphoryl group from the ATP onto this bicarbonate to form this carboxyphosphate. And the reason we have to carry this step out is to actually prepare that molecule to bind that CO2 molecule onto that biotin. Because without this step, the CO2 would simply not be able to bind onto that biotin binding site of that enzyme. So once again, recall that carbon dioxide exists as bicarbonate ions in the cytoplasm and in our fluids of the body. And in the first step of this process, we essentially use an ATP molecule to activate the carbon dioxide to form the carboxyphosphate. This is our carboxyphosphate complex. And so we form the, AT, uh, the ADP that we have here on the product side. So now that we have an active CO2 molecule, it is ready to be attached onto the biotin component of that enzyme. And that's exactly what happens in step two. Now I should mention that there is a requirement to attach that CO2 onto the biotin. This attachment only takes place if we have a coenzyme present attached onto that enzyme known as acetyl coenzyme A or acetyl CoA. So this enzyme is required for the CO2 to actually bind onto that biotin. And the coenzyme has to be bound onto that pyruvate carboxylate for the step to actually take place. So we see that in the next step, the phosphorylated CO2 can now attach onto the biotin of the enzyme and form that carboxy biotin enzyme intermediate. So this intermediate here. And so this bond that is formed between the carbon dioxide and the biotin that is bound onto the enzyme is actually a very reactive bond. It's a very high in energy bond. And when we break that bond, that actually releases a certain amount of energy that releases 20 kilojoules of energy. And so that's exactly why we call this an, an activated bond because it's an activated bond. It's very reactive. And in the final step, we're going to basically use this high energy in the bond to attach that molecule onto that pyruvate to form the oxaloacetate. So once again, the bond holding the CO2 and the biotin enzyme together is quite unstable and quite reactive. And so when we cleave that in the next step, that will release 20 kilojoules of energy per mole that we actually use up. So in the final step, we have the enzyme biotin CO2 complex that we basically formed here that is mixed with that pyruvate molecule and that forms that oxaloacetate. So we're able to actually use this very activated and reactive complex to attach that CO2 on the oxaloacetate molecule. And so if we sum up these reactions, we essentially get this net reaction here.
And again, I have to emphasize that the coenzyme we call acetyl-CoA is required for the CO2 to bind to that biotin. And without it, that binding will not take place. And actually, as we'll discuss in more detail in a future lecture, this actually creates a very important, uh, a very important regulatory point of the process of gluconeogenesis. So remember this point because we're going to uh, uh, cover it again in a future lecture when we discuss how we actually regulate the process of gluconeogenesis. Now, by the way, this entire process, step one, takes place entirely in the matrix of the mitochondria of our cell. And that's because pyruvate carboxylase is only found in the matrix of the mitochondria. So the conversion of pyruvate into the oxaloacetate intermediate by pyruvate carboxylase. So these three steps essentially take place in the matrix of the mitochondria. Now, step two actually takes place in the cytoplasm. So as we might imagine, now we have to basically transport that oxaloacetate intermediate into the cytoplasm. But before we actually transport the oxaloacetate, we have to reduce it into a malate molecule. And so what happens in the matrix of the mitochondria is, an enzyme called malate dehydrogenase uses an NADH to reduce the oxaloacetate into malate and we form the NAD plus in its oxidized form. And now the malate can move across the two membranes of the mitochondria by using special proteins and eventually enters the cytoplasm. And once it enters cytoplasm, before it can basically react in step two of gluconeogenesis, that malate has to be transformed back into oxaloacetate by using that same enzyme, malate, malate dehydrogenase. But now, instead of using NADH, we're using NAD plus because we basically want to oxidize the malate back into oxaloacetate, <coughs> producing that reduced version of the NAD molecule. So let's take a look at step two. Now remember in step one the entire goal was to use the highly exergonic process of the hydrolysis of ATP to basically drive the endergonic process of the attachment of the CO2 molecule onto that pyruvate. So we saw that the carboxylation process is actually an endergonic process. Now that implies if carboxylation requires energy, that means decarboxylation actually, uh, actually releases energy. And that's important in this step because what happens in this step is this oxaloacetate is transformed into phosphoenolpyruvate and in the process, there are, two different, there are two different things that take place. Number one is we essentially undergo the process of decarboxylation where this CO2 group is actually released. And number two, we also phosphorylate this oxaloacetate into this molecule. Now, when we, phos when we phosphorylate the molecule, that actually requires energy. And so if this reaction just took place with phosphorylation, that would mean an energy, an, an energy input would be required. But because we essentially couple the exothermic, the uh, exergonic decarboxylation with the endergonic phosphorylation, this process, basically the, uh, the sum of those processes basically creates a favorable reaction. And so in the second step, we see that an enzyme called phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase or PEP carboxykinase converts the oxaloacetate into PEP. Now, carboxykinase once again means we're coupling the decarboxylation reaction with the phosphorylation reaction. So in this step, the highly endergonic phosphorylation of this molecule is coupled with the highly exergonic decarboxylation process. So in two steps, we basically are able to create a pathway that is favorable energetically. And so we form that phosphoenolpyruvate in this two-step process. So we have step number one and step number two. 
And if we sum up these two individual steps, this is the net reaction that we're going to get. Notice the CO2s will essentially cancel because they're intermediates and so will these oxaloacetates cancel because they appear on both sides, they're intermediate. So these two molecules cancel, the CO2 will cancel and we sum up these two results and this is what we get. So a pyruvate molecule in the presence of one ATP and one GTP in a water molecule forms that, P, uh, that PEP, the phosphoenolpyruvate, the ADP, GDP, and the two plus ion. So, and these are the two steps in gluconeogenesis, the first two steps in gluconeogenesis.